I'm going to keep them out and, and refer them to particular speakers. Um, are we sure of one of that? Is this Oh, okay. So, so, so the, the first question, uh, Nick, is for you probably. Uh, there are several quick parts to it. Does DPS slow progression of the disease? Does it worsen a person's balance problems? Does it improve freezing or make it worse? Um, so, those, those are all good questions, common questions that uh, people wonder about. Um, so definitely it is not a, a, a therapy that slows disease progression in the sense that, um, you know, actually even last week I had a patient who was thinking about TBS and I was explaining to him that he wasn't a good candidate, and then he's like, well, how am I going to get the cure? And I, and I said, it's not, it's not a cure for anybody, and so um, it's not a cure. Um, it could indirectly improve a disease progression if it can keep you more mobile and, and doing things and keep on your feet and exercise, um, but not directly be like helping the cells that are sick. Um, the next question is, it can worse, worsen balance. It can also help balance. Um, any of, you, any of you who've been in my clinic have heard me say many times that uh, gait is very complicated. It's involved with your vision, your postural reflexes, how good your steps are, how you can feel your feet. So there's lots of things going on. So DBS can help you take bigger steps and so forth, but in the largest trials done actually can worsen falls in some patients. So it's, it's a complicated thing. And then freezing, same thing. It can help in certain situations. If, if your freezing response to meds, then it might respond to DBS. But if it doesn't respond to meds, then it probably won't respond to DBS. So let me add a question, uh, perhaps for Kate. Um, Kate, um, would you want to make a comment about um, cognitive function or dysfunction and eligibility for DBS, uh, and also uh, what are the effects of DBS on patients who may have some mild cognitive impairment? Absolutely. Um, so we do sometimes get referrals at the Memory and Aging Center to evaluate a patient who's either a good candidate for DBS, and because often if the patient has really significant cognitive impairment, they're not considered a good candidate for DBS. And I think part of this is, is because DBS can, in some cases, actually worsen cognition a, a little bit. And so that's something to um, consider um, when you're considering this surgery. Do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, I, I think it's definitely, um, again, similar to gait, I think you can indirectly help cognition in some cases if people are requiring high doses of meds for their tremor and other things, and those are impacting cognition, you can decrease the meds and less help cognition, but especially the more further along people are having some cognitive impairment, that's kind of like we call it like taking a hit. Uh, you can't absorb that hit from having either the frontal lobe being punctured through or um, the stimulation itself that can impair it. So that's why we're, that's probably the number one thing we look, up, uh, look at in terms of can to see. All right. Um, a question for John, for that two or three. If, if PD starts in the gut, that, uh, what should we eat and drink? Is flatulence part of having Parkinson's disease? And there are other questions along the same lines. If PD begins via the digestive system, have nutritional based therapies been adequately explored? Any positive results? Do you want to try that? Well, I, um, I think that you should um, eat things that you really like to eat. <laughs> and eat no, I'm just kidding. Uh, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, that um, uh, I think the real question here is, you know, does do the, we know, I'm sure all of you read a lot about what this, uh, the term that's coming to use now, microbiome, all of the, the whole community of bacteria that live uh, in your intestines and they play a big role in things like obesity, they play a role in early onset rheumatoid arthritis, um, and we believe that they play a role in, in other diseases as well. And whether they actually play a role in the onset of Parkinson's disease remains to be seen, but there in fact are studies being done right now to study populations of bacteria in the gut of people, intestines of people with Parkinson's and compare that to people who don't have Parkinson's disease. Usually they try to get a spousal match, so one spouse does not have disease and the other one does because Presumably, they're eating very similar diets. Um, 
the way they do that is they actually now, with the kind of DNA sequencing technology we have, we can actually sequence just millions and millions of independent reads and work out a population profile of all of the bacteria. And I think in the next few years, we'll really get a much clearer idea of exactly um, what role, if any, uh, the microbiome plays in, uh, in the onset and, and genesis of Parkinson's. A question to Dr. Christine. Um, why do patients with PD have below normal serum cholesterol and vitamin D levels? Do you advise correcting this with supplementation? Uh, I'll take on D first. Uh, we don't know why people have low levels of D, uh, but they, compared to uh, H-match population, um, D levels are lower uh, in people with Parkinson's disease than um, the, other, the rest of the population. Um, we suspect that that might not be in your favor. We think um, as we D, D levels are um, associated with good bone health, and increasingly there are studies showing some um, relationships to low B12 status, sorry, sorry, low D status and, um, and cognitive impairment. Um, it's probably a good idea to be to make sure your status is adequate, um, probably by measurement and then um, supplementation. Uh, the cholesterol question, I think we don't understand that well at all either. It's, um, it's been shown in a number of studies that, that cholesterol levels are lower. Um, um, this may relate to the gut. Um, it may relate to absorption. Um, it's possible it relates to um, decreased um, intake of foods um, more generally that might occur related to uh, reductions in taste and sense of smell as time goes on. These are Great questions, don't have good answers. Uh, so I think to sort of uh, piggyback on what you were talking about, um, eat what you like, but eat um, a well-balanced diet. And I think um, although the recent press has said something about you know vitamins don't help everybody, I, I think that um, we should amend that to say they may not help everybody, but probably some supplementation of Parkinson's disease is reasonable. Okay, there's a question here about have you looked at mitochondrial function in the brain? The answer is yes. In fact, one of our faculty, Dr. Nakamura, is focusing particularly on that. There is a disturbance of mitochondrial function in the brain of patients with Parkinson's disease, um, and uh, he is focusing on that in his studies. Perhaps next year he'll be able to give us a talk about that. There are several questions about the world of ultrasound therapy. Um, Nick, do you want to comment about ultrasonic um, Lesioning studies. Oh, uh, I guess yes. Yeah. So there's there's the new um, less invasive technique. Uh, you you might know that um, probably the, the oldest, um, the first stereotactic or functional neurosurgery done for Parkinson's and tremor were the lesioning surgeries with um, same process of getting to the target, but instead of putting a pacemaker in, you literally burn a little hole. Uh, or uh, ablative surgeries, and that can produce some of the same side of, uh, same benefits. Um, and recently, uh, but that's again still requires a verbal, still requires uh, going through the brain. So recently, people have tried gamma knife, which is intersecting beams of radiation that still make a hole there. Uh, there's problems with that that we won't get into. But ultrasound is the, is the most recent. Um, so it has the definite benefits of not having make any surgical incisions. Uh, you can target that spot that you need and intersect hundreds of ultrasound beams um, to create that same lesion. And actually, there's some other cool things as well. You can actually put sub, sub threshold uh, intensity of ultrasound to test if it's working. Um, so you can see if you're in the right spot by seeing if the tremor decreases and then if you are, then you can kind of turn it up and, and do that. Um, there are some problems with it. Number one, probably it takes hours to do. Um, I think Dr. Larson was told us six, seven hours. Um, and uh, we don't do it here at UCSF. Stanford is doing that, um, University of Virginia, and some other places. <clears throat> and also, I think that you know anything where, like, just like if you have a abdominal ultrasound, you have to have a gel and, and, and no hair, so you have to shave your head and so forth. And for, during those hours, it causes a lot of nausea. But, but definitely, with, for patients who can't get intracranial surgery, it's, it's an option for some aspects of Parkinson's. But, but I believe it remains investigational. Oh, yes, yes, very much investigational. So Stanford and Virginia and the other places are, it's a clinical trial. 
Let me just uh, interject something here because uh, phase one studies, phase two studies and so on have been mentioned over the course of today and I'm not sure whether you're all aware of what these different phases are. A phase one study is an uncontrolled study to look at simply at the safety of a drug. People may look at its efficacy as well if they wish but the aim of the study is to make sure that a particular trial drug is safe to take. A phase two study is when one looks not only at the safety of the drug, but also at its efficacy. Um, and that typically would involve having a, a, a control group of people who are not taking the drug, but taking the placebo. A phase three study is a much larger study uh, for, for drugs that have gone through phase one and phase two, a much larger study in which the efficacy of a particular drug is compared to existing drugs. So those are the three phases that a drug requires to go through before it will be approved by the FDA. And that may take, probably will take, five, six, seven years. Um, just so you understand that although a drug has been reported last week uh, to perhaps be effective in the treatment of Parkinson's patients, uh, whether that actually turns out to be the case, and if it does, whether that drug will become available uh, as a uh, treatment for the disease will take another five to seven years, at least. Um, going on from that, um, there's a question here about GABA effect. A GABA receptor is not being effective in Parkinson's disease. Has GABA pentine been looked at? Chad, do you want to take that? So, um, the question is GABA pentine in Parkinson's disease. Yeah, so I, I think uh, GABA receptors uh, are up and, up and running in Parkinson's disease. Um, uh, Different agents that, that stimulate them, uh, like we gallium and, um, and so we can't hear you. Hello. Hello. Um, so uh, GABA receptors do work in Parkinson's disease. Um, GABA pentin uh, is effective for many patients with uh, Parkinson's disease. So um, I, I and. But so so I think there isn't a problem um, for that for that agent or for valine in patients with Parkinson's. All right. A question for Kate Person. Are crosswords beneficial? Uh, yes, absolutely. If you enjoy doing crosswords, then that's a really good choice. So what I tell patients is it's important to keep your brain active. It's also important to you know have fun. And so if you can make sure what you choose to keep your brain active is fun for you, then that's a good choice. And also, if you choose activities that keep you socially engaged, that's um, A+. Plus. All right. There's a question here about, let's find it again. Um, are there particular treatments that can be directed to patients with specific precursor symptoms, i.e. before Parkinson's disease becomes evident and diagnosable? Well, the answer to that is that um, uh, a number of patients with Parkinson's disease will have developed, often years before they develop the motor disturbances of Parkinson's disease, have developed anosmia or a disturbance of the sense of smell, or constipation, or other such, or sometimes depression or anxiety. The problem is that all these sorts of complaints are fairly non-specific. I mean, uh, uh, anosmia or disturbance of smell is very common, for example, particularly in people who've got allergies or colds or whatever, and um, there is no way really to identify precursor symptoms with such specificity that one could initiate treatments even if there were treatments to initiate. Obviously, if there were treatments to initiate at an early stage, they would be treatments to try to stop or slow down the development of the disease, whereas most of our existing treatments, as you've heard today, are really treatments of the underlying symptoms and not treatments that are going to prevent the disease from progressing. Um, any comments about, from any of you guys about that question? There's a question for Dr. Christine here concerning exercise. How, com how comparatively beneficial are the high intensity interval workouts versus the longer, less intense regular workouts described in your slides? It's a great question. I think there's a lot of passion around those issues. If you're really working hard, you're pushing to the nth degree, are you doing yourself a, a much better favor 
from an exercise standpoint. Um, I think you know there are definitely advocates of the, the highest intensity, the mixed um, the, the mixed inputs, you know, um, playing cards while you're jogging on a treadmill, treadmill and, and doing things like that. Um, we don't we the, the, there's definitely a lot of passion around those questions, but I don't think we have the full answers. I think um, doing something is better than doing nothing. Doing a little bit more is probably better than doing just some. And um, and we don't have the answers regarding the, the highest intensity programs and, and their relative benefits. It's not always the case that more is better. All right. There's a question addressed to Dr. Forsyth, although I'm not sure that um, this is one that he's going to particularly want to answer. Um, can an acute event such as nicotine overdose or exposure to the innards of a household battery paste uh, trigger Parkinson's disease? <laughs> I hope so. You know, anything is possible. <laughs> but I, but I, I must say, though, that, you know, now I back to what I said before, you know, I, I guess it goes back to this thing of, like, well, you know, what did I do? I mean, am I responsible for the fact that I got Parkinson's disease? That's really what this question is. And the answer is, you know, you don't have to, uh, with all the burden of the disease you carry, you don't have to carry a burden of guilt as well. It's not your fault, okay? And so, you know, any time you sort of think about, um, you know, uh, some incident in your past life, and what could it be that? Did I spray the roses? Did I, uh, did I break under that battery? You know, don't go down that road. Really, don't go down that road. Okay. So, um, in the United States, there is there are a lot of protections in place now for for workers, particularly expo exposed to chemicals in the workplace. The problem is that the more we learn about the various potential neurotoxins, uh, the more we uh, lower the allowable uh, level. And how, how reliable some of the studies are concern, concerning neurotoxins is really very unclear indeed. Let me give you, a, uh, give you an example. Years ago, in the 1970s, it was said that painters, house painters, developed an encephalopathy, developed a disturbance of brain function. Their memory became less good, for example, and so on. And there were innumerable studies that came out, particularly from Scandinavia, but they had very good health services, uh, reporting this. It was only 10 or 20 years later that it came to be realized that basically they had not compared uh, the patients to adequate controls. And then it transpired that the guys who chose to be painters in the first place had these cognitive disturbances to begin with. So, really negating 20 years of research. So, that's that there are many problems to do with understanding, understanding the potential of, of certain chemicals to, to have neurotoxicity. The other part of that question was to do with nicotine. Now, it's been known for many years, actually, that cigarette smokers have a lower incidence, I'm assuming they survive, have a lower incidence <laughs> of um, Parkinson's disease than non uh, than smokers than non-smokers. So cigarette smoking seemed in some way to be protective, and that led to trials of nicotine. Chad, do you want to say a word about the nicotine trials? It's ongoing. <laughs> so, well, let me expand on that. So there was a trial. There was a trial several years ago, actually, which failed to show any protective benefit, despite what I've just told you about cigarette smokers. Um, that trial is now being repeated, uh, and that's what Dr. Dr. Christine is referring to. So, um, the other question on the sheet of paper for, addressed to everybody is, what is the youngest PD case that you know of? Anyone want to make a comment about that? The young, how, how early have you seen Parkinsonism present? Um, I, I think the earliest patient's age in my clinic was like 33. Can you talk a bit louder? Yeah, I, I think the youngest patient I've seen in my clinic is 33, uh, actually 31. Um, 
uh, although that patient and another patient with Mayoros had actually had symptoms since high school, but they're the outliers, they're a genetic form of Parkinson's. They, they both have the PARC2 or PARC mutation. So there are these outliers. So part of the problem in answering that question is that I, it was the question directed actually at Parkinson's disease, or was it directed at a neurological disorder in which there may be Parkinsonian features, stiffness, slowness, whatever. Uh, for example, there is a disorder called Wilson's disease, which is a disturbance of copper um, carrying in, in, in the body. And those patients may present at 20 with a variety, or younger, or older, with a number of neurological complaints, including tremors of a variety of sorts, sometimes including a Parkinsonian type of syndrome. There is a disorder called Huntington's disease, in which people have made wild swinging movements of their limbs and may have a cognitive impairment. Sometimes that disorder could present in young people with a disorder that looks exactly like Parkinson's disease. So it comes down to a matter to that question. The answer to that question comes down to really what do we mean by saying someone's got Parkinson's disease? All right, there's a question for Ms. Wang. Um, Kathy, can you be too old to get social security disability? I, over the age of 65, do benefits stop at 65? That's the question. Social security disability? I'm sorry, what? A social security disability, is that what the question is? Social security disability, the question was. So if someone is 72, can they still get social security disability? I think that's what the question was asking. You can, it depends how long you've paid into, well, they say pay into, it depends how long you've been working. So, um, and I'm sorry, it's, it's a very general answer because I'll have to find out more about your situation. Um, but it is possible. All right. Um, you gave us a lot, of, a lot of information and a lot of resources. Is this information, um, do you have a handout or something that people can, um, uh, where can people find this information? You know, um, I, I don't have a handout, but I, um, I'm happy if, I don't know if our PowerPoints can be shared with people. That's one way, and another yeah. is if you contact me via email, I'm happy to give you all that information as well. Right. Um, just as a matter of interest, I think for the last two years we've put our, our, um, our, our meeting, our conference, online uh, after the, the speakers have reviewed their presentations and assuming that they don't object to it, having it put online. So that would occur in a few weeks' time. We have our own website at UCSF, the UCSF Parkinson's disease. If you put that into Google, you'll find it. Um, and so you should be able to access this conference and see it again uh, online uh, in a few weeks' time. Maybe I should, three or four months, depends on how, um, how quickly we can get down to it. But th that would be the plan, in which case you would be able, with Kathy's agreement, to access uh, her, her, her talk. There's a question here, um, does levodopa aggravate bipolar disorder? Chad, do you want to answer that? That's a very specific question. Um, so um, I, I, I think I'll s step back a little bit and say that um, that the dopaminergic treatments uh, could aggravate underlying psychiatric disease. That's certainly possible. Um, and, and Or they can cause psychiatric or um, behavioral symptoms. And so uh, if you think about dopamine agonists, there's been this whole new phenomena of what is called impulse control disorders. Um, which are oftentimes new habits, uh, new new things that people take on, and it, which can, which sometimes is benign, like washing dishes or, or, or vacuuming the floor, and sometimes uh, much more colorful um, than that, um, and sometimes dangerous like gambling. Um, so that's dopamine agonist. It probably also occurs in people on treatment with levodopa as well, but to a much uh, lesser extent. Um, I've certainly treated a number of people with bipolar, um, with, um, with levodopa before, and um, I'd say usually it's fairly well tolerated, but... Yeah, do you want to add something to that? Um, yeah, I, I completely agree. I think um, the potential is there, um, but usually, we actually have, I, you know, 
quite a few patients with uh, bipolar diagnosis as well. Um, the one case I can think of where I felt that the, the manic symptoms were, were exacerbated was when I think at a time when his bipolar was not well treated, um, late, and I had just gone up by half tap per dose and, and triggered uh, a manic episode. I think later, a year later or so, when they were better controlled, he rechallenged cautiously and, and it went smoother. So I have a little bit more reservations than you guys then. Um, so I have first of all taken the depressive side of bipolar disease. I remember when levodopa first came out, this was in the late 60s and early 70s, um, there were a number of reports of patients with depression who got worse, but there were also reports of, uh, uh, reports of other patients with depression who got better. And so there seemed to be a somewhat variable response of patients with depression um, to levodopa. With regard to bipolar disease, in addition to the depressive side, there would be the other side where people became more manic or hypermanic or psychotic or whatever. And, and I must say, I would be very cautious or concerned about treating those patients with levodopa. As a general rule, we generally try to keep the dose of medication at the lowest level that is effective. And some patients seem to be on more than they need to be. And I would certainly be very concerned to ensure that the dose was not um, more than it really had to be, in, particularly in such patients. <coughs> A question for Nick. Can DBS implant be successful initially and then stop working effectively? So, so definitely. Um, Obviously, if something happens with the hardware, the, the wire that's from the battery to the, to the brain breaks or something, there's obvious things like that. Um, but I think it, it, the most, I think what they mean, what you mean by the question is um, everything's going well hardware-wise and so forth, and can I just stop working? Obviously, there's the battery draining and everything. But um, in general, what we see is that, and we have patients now implanted 15 plus years, especially part of the largest study, the co-op study, and what we see um, is that things like tremor, rigidity, the fluctuations, what it, what it helps initially should, it, should be some help, and, and a quite a, a large proportion of that help uh, for a long time in some patients. However, what I think is perceived as not working anymore is when the other symptoms of Parkinson's can progress in some people, uh, like imbalance and like cognitive problems that the DBS was not going to help in the first place. So. Um, so I think that's really the main thing, but certainly uh, it won't, it's probably not going to work as perfectly it does, as it does in the first few years, but again, we have patients now 15 plus years out that the tremor is still controlled and, and so forth, but other things have become the focus of disability. Okay, there's a question about salivation. Um, the question reads, um, can you speak to the treatment for salivation, especially, I can't read the next word, what are the ups and, ups and downs of treatment? So, uh, Chad, hypersalivation. Uh, it's very common in, uh, in Parkinson's disease, um, but not everyone uh, has, has the problem. Um, uh, initially, just remembering and making a habit of, of swallowing can help. Um, some people use some things like um, sugar-free candies to help remind them to swallow. Um, there are also um, medications such as um, glycopyrrolate that can be used to reduce uh, sal saliva production. Um, and uh, if that's not effective, uh, Botox can be used and it's quite successful. Any, any, other, any other comments from anybody? All right, there's a question here. Are there many people here today who take Vitari? What's the answer to that? So three or four. Four or five people, maybe. Do you like it better than Cinemet? Okay. Uh, I'm a new user, the, the, the question has written, and I'm still not sure if I like it. Um, I, I must say that I have not prescribed my target. Well, I've prescribed it to one person, actually, and I don't yet know how well they're doing with it. Um, so Vitari, as you know, was approved about eight or nine months ago now. Uh, for a, a number of months, it really wasn't available in pharmacies, so, um, but now it is in, in, in many. But uh, I don't know how it compares cost-wise to um, 
other preparations of levodopa. And I think experience with it generally has been very, very limited. Have, have any of you guys used Vitami? Uh, so I haven't used it myself, but I have prescribed it a number of times. And, uh, and I'd say that uh, there's a mixed experience with it. I think some, some people say it, it fills in gaps very nicely for them and there's more on time. Um, but I've heard other people um, say that they have um, some, that part of the day may be very well treated and the, the latter part of the day may not be as well treated. Um, so it's, it's really been one of those things that we're, we're working out with, with each patient and I've, we've certainly seen some patients who transferred to it and, uh, and then migrated back to uh, more conventional therapy. So I've added a mixed experience. Um, I, I probably have around 20 to 25 patients that has been, been on it. Um, we, being in the DBS center, we see almost by definition a lot of fluctuating patients. Um, so kind of the, the key person that could benefit from it. So um, we have these very patients that really fluctuate. Some take many taking out meds every hour, hour and a half, and so forth. So those are people that are going to really have it. Those are people that are targeting the best chance of helping. So I, I have a pretty. I mean, I would say the majority, if not a high majority, of our patients of those 20 have really preferred it to. Um, the regular Udopa formulations. And so I have a couple of people that did not like it. Um, towards the evening, they were getting a little too activated and having trouble sleeping. Um, another person um, who was probably our most brittle diabetic, a uh, diabetic, but dyskinetic patient um, uh, just could not tolerate it from the dyskinesia. Um, and then there's the cost issue. But most people have had a pretty positive experience. Uh, and what, did you have any trouble in getting the insurance companies to cover it? We, yeah. we, yeah. So uh, that it's, it's as, as we can tell medicine issues, I think, you know, every payer in, in this country is different, and so it's very hard to predict. Um, we, we have had a, an amazing nurse who is just going in and trying to figure out everything, you know, Karen. Um, and so who just really gets in there and fights the companies and gets tier exemptions and so forth. So we've had better luck maybe because of that, but still it can be excruciatingly expensive for some people. But it has, I, would, I, would, I guess the way I would put it is we've had to rethink if we're going to require people to try right before DPS because it has been that successful for some people for, um, for fluctuations. All right. Let me stop at this point. Um, I think that uh, Aaron Day is going to have uh, an announcement to make. Aaron, do you want to come up? Um, again, before you all go, I just want to express my gratitude again to, the, to, to TABA for an unrestricted educational grant, as I said earlier on, that supported this uh, conference today, and the National Parkinson Foundation as well, who support us. Um, and I want to thank Aaron and, and all the volunteers today, uh, as well as the speakers who have given their Saturday to be here. So I just wanted to say thank you again for your continued patronage. This conference, I think, means a lot to a lot of people. And um, one thing that I saw, one of the questions that I wanted to make sure to acknowledge is, you know, that this is a patients and caregivers conference, and we do this, you know, for the edification of everyone. And I wanted to acknowledge the caregivers especially, because I think that sometimes they get lost in the fold. So we could have a hand for the Pauline Fisher from the NPF, who is uh, just going to say a few words, um, and uh, thank you again so much. Hi everyone, I really appreciate the fact that y'all are here, and there were some incredible questions and an incredible group of panelists. Um, I wanted to thank Dr. Amanoff and Aaron and Marianne for the opportunity to just take a quick minute of your time. I know people want to get home, so I promise to be brief and exciting. Um, so. First of all, I am Colleen Fisher. I'm with the National Parkinson Foundation. I am the Community Development Manager for Northern California. And I do live and work here, right here in the Bay Area. So I'm your go-to girl for all things National Parkinson Foundation. Um, I'm also the Moving Day Coordinator. So the walkathon that some of you may have been hearing about, that is part of my job description and what I'm so proud of and one of the things I've been so excited to bring to the Bay Area in the last year. Um, as you leave today, there are some hospitalization kits, those aware and care kits that you may have been hearing about. 
Um, I just want to tell you a, a quick little bit about them. First of all, um, the team at UCSF, Dr. Christine, Dr. Amanoff, Marianne, they were instrumental in helping to put that kit together with the National Parkinson Foundation. So it's really a fantastic thing to bring home. The one thing I like to say about it is that it helps encourage a dialogue with your caregivers when you're hospitalized for any reason. It doesn't matter if it's Parkinson's related or not. It just helps you say, I have Parkinson's. Getting these medications on time every time is really critical to me, to my family member, and it allows me to have less complications. So, you know, in educating them. In the medical system, everybody gets deluged. There's so much information going around. So really using that kit to help develop a conversation means a great deal. So definitely pick one up. If they are gone, those are available for order at parkinson.org. That's the National Parkinson Foundation website. They are free of charge. There is no cost to send them to you or anyone that you know that needs one. So please never hesitate to let folks know. Um, the last thing I want to talk about quickly is just moving day. We do have our dates secured for 2016. It's going to be an incredibly exciting event, a way to come out and break some of the isolation that some of us feel with Parkinson's, and a way to come out and learn about resources and exercise, maybe try a Tai Chi class or yoga, or learn about dance, or all of those different things so you can try and experiment with some different exercises because we know that it's so crucial for your mental, physical, and emotional health. Um, one of the things that I'm most excited about is that in the Bay Area this year, we were privileged to raise over $300,000 in our inaugural year with Moving Day. It was absolutely phenomenal. Um, and the best part about Moving Day is that over $100,000 of those funds that were raised stay local and are going to be granted to local organizations, many of which are here today and have submitted grant applications. So we can continue to help the Bay Area community, not just Parkinson's patients nationally, which is so important, to make sure that our patients here have the help that they need. So I'll be available as people leave to ask questions. Um, also, Ann Boylan and Debbie Sternbach are two of my favorite outreach volunteers. They've been tremendous in helping me. So if you have questions, you can certainly ask both of them. And I encourage you all to come out and thank you again for making this an absolutely incredible day for all of us. Safe trip home, everybody. And one last thing, for those of you who asked about our website, the, the web address is pdcenter.neurology.ucsf.edu.